let me adopt the protocol that you have kindly established and thank all the governors, the chair, and all the governors, and yourself, Gilbert, for bringing me here. But let me also congratulate the Governing Council, yourself, and the organization, IFAD, as you are celebrating the 40th anniversary of the establishment of this organization that has played an important role, particularly in our own part in Africa, in the area of agriculture generally, that rural development and rural economy. Let me also thank you for making it possible for me not only to be here, but to be here in time and also to be able to deal with other uh, businesses that I have to deal with. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to contribute to the theme of this 41st session, which is from fragility to long-term resilience, investing in sustainable rural economies. Because recent events and projections across the globe have left me concerned about the ability and capacity of countries, particularly in Africa, to move from fragility to resilience and to overcome the challenges of food insecurity, malnutrition, extreme poverty, youth unemployment, and rural underdevelopment. Let me hasten to point out that every nation has some element of fragility somewhere within it. Some of the events and projections which have left me, and I believe many others worried about the future of the world generally, but particularly the rural poor, are what I am going to dwell upon. First, frequent and extreme weather events occasioned by climate change continue to have negative effects on rural livelihoods globally but especially in Africa, where agriculture is the mainstay of rural economies. While some in Washington still believe that climate change is a ruse designed by China against American businesses, for us in Africa, climate change is no longer an abstract concept. It is our reality. Maybe those anywhere who are still in doubt will believe the satellite picture that sea level is rising. I have just visited Cape Town in South Africa, where the city is facing its worst drought in recent history and portable water is being rationed 
with much adversity packed on hygiene, sanitation, and health. The sad jokes in Cape Town today are that it is now legal to share a bath with a stranger, and it is a crime to wash your car. Big South African farmers have provided succor to the, to the city by releasing over 10 million liters of water from their dams to extend the anticipation day zero from 16 April to 11 May. And yet, the situation in Cape Town has been declared a national disaster. If drought has affected the city in such a manner, one can only imagine what the situation is in the rural areas and the impact of the drought on the adjoining rural economies. The situation of the Lake Chad Basin has even more, uh, more severe impact on rural economies in some parts of Africa. The Lake Chad, which provides livelihood for millions of people from Nigeria, Niger, Chad, uh, the Jair Republic, Chad, and Cameroon is today about only 20% of what it used to be 50 years ago. The lake has shrunk from 15,000 to 500 square miles in 40 years. If it is not replenished, the lake will dry up completely within the next 30 years. The shrinking of the Lake Chad has contributed immensely to frequent violent clashes in the area over control of the lake's resources. The emergence and spread of the Boko Haram is not unconnected with the, with the desperate situation of the Lake Chad Basin. The economic impact of the situation in Lake Chad Basin is captured by two accounts as follows in the, int, uh, in the overview of the crisis. And I quote, around 17 million people live in the affected areas across the four lake, uh, across the four lake Chad Basin countries. More than 2.3 million people remain displaced. Most of the displaced families are sheltered by communities that count among the world's poorest and most vulnerable food insecurity and mal malnutrition have reached critical level. Another view, the impact of the drying lake is causing tensions among communities around the Lake Chad. There are repeated conflicts among nationals of different countries over control of the remaining water Cameroonians and Nigerians in Darak village. For example, constantly fight over the water. Nigerians claim to be the first settlers in the village, while Cameroonians invoke nationalistic sentiments since the village is within Cameroonian territory. Fishermen also want farmers and herdsmen to cease diverting lake water to their farmlands and livestock." End of quotation. I am pleased to note that the Lake Chad Basin Commission has prepared a Lake Chad Development and Climate Resilience Action Plan for immediate, medium, and long-term actions. It is important that in addition to the countries concerned, development organizations like IFAD to key into these initiatives aimed at reversing the misfortune of over 30 million rural people who depend on the Lake Chad and its wider basin for, life, for livelihood. The second issue of concern 
is increasing refugee crisis resulting from violent conflict. According to the United Nations, and I quote, the world is witnessing the highest levels of displacement on record. An unprecedented 65.6 million people around the world have been forced from home by conflict and persecution at the end of 2016. Among them are nearly 22.5 million refugees, over half of whom are under the age of 18. End of quotation. It is instructive that of the 65.6 million displaced people, Africa south of uh, Sahara accounts for 30%, with the Middle East and North Africa accounting for 26%, Europe 17%, and the Americas 16%, and Asia 11%. In South Sudan, a country with a population of some 12 million people, there are about 1.4 million refugees. The latest is Myanmar. The effect of the global refugee crisis on jobs, food and security, and general livelihoods of rural population is chilling. In my own country, Nigeria, Rising insecurity caused by Boko Haram and clashes between herdsmen and farmers over diminishing land resources has led to thousands of deaths and many abandoned farmlands, communities, and livelihoods. In Bono State, in the northeastern part of our country, where the menace of Boko Haram is prevalent, Rural economies have not only taken a hit, but there are rep rep uh, reports of over one million rural people under the threat of starvation, despite the relative return of security and normalcy in some areas of the state. Many farmers still do not have sufficient security to return to their farms, and many are in internally displaced uh, uh, people's camp. In Africa, like in many other areas of the world, affected by terrorism, rural populations have borne more of the brunt of menace than urban populations. Even at the peak of its deadly campaign, Boko Haram did not target urban population as much as it did the rural communities, which were soft targets. With little or no effective state security systems, rural economies remained vulnerable and susceptible to frequent and intense disruption due to acts of terrorism and other forms of violence. Disease epidemic outbreaks are also a threat to rural economies, especially in developing countries, as we have witnessed in West Africa, in the case of the Ebola virus outbreak that disrupted the economies of Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone. Recently, the Sika fever outbreak affected many local small businesses in South America. Outbreaks of other diseases like cholera have also had a toll on rural economies where poor education and poverty are the lot of the people. In its weekly bulletin covering the period between 27th January and 2nd February 2018, the World Health Organization reports that it was monitoring 50 five events in its African region, including 44 disease outbreaks and 11 humanitarian crises. With 55 countries in Africa, 
This is an average of one disease outbreak or humanitarian crisis per country. All of this has implications for rural economies and indicate that urgent action is required to make rural economies resilient to disease outbreak. Ladies and gentlemen, the time to act is now. And in seeking solution to make our rural economies more resilient against man-made and natural disasters, let us bear in mind that no person or institution can successfully deal with the earlier mentioned challenges and eradicate poverty, hunger, and malnutrition without effective collaboration. It will take collective and co co uh, collaborative efforts to bring about the changes necessary and to make the desirable impact. Also, such solutions should aim to address the issues of policy inconsistencies, poor implementation of policies, and weak leadership, especially in developing countries, which continue to inhibit their ability to be freed of the shackles of food insecurity, malnutrition, diseases, unemployment, and poverty. Which are the ways to go? First, all stakeholders must commit and remain committed to building the capacities of rural dwellers to adapt to climate change and other changes within society that are beyond their control. This will require improvement on traditional methods, technologies, and practices let me emphasize the need for improvement rather than outright replacement of, tra of traditional methods, technologies, and practices, because often we find that foreign experts prescribe one-size-fits-all approaches and expect them to work for all people everywhere. From experience, people, especially rural dwellers, who are deep rooted in culture and tradition tend to resist change. This is why it is critical to take what they are familiar with and improve on it, rather than introduce new ideas and concepts which may not work for them, even if they worked perfectly in other situations or different climes. Engagement and inclusion of the local rural population in designing appropriate and, uh, approaches is key in ensuring success of such initiatives and programs. Second, in low-income economies like we have in Africa, there remains the challenge of weak institutions and poor state capacity. Investment in rural economies without strengthening of the institutions that will protect and promote them cannot yield much result. One area that requires urgent and critical investment is in building the capacity of institutions to adequate, adequately capture the informal sector. In many African countries, for instance, Rural economies, which are mostly informal, are hardly ever captured by state institutions. The effect is that there's no evidence-based planning for rural economies. If a country like Nigeria has no data on its rural businesses, what data can an international body like IFAD rely on for its programming or planning for uh, such a country. It is therefore imperative that stakeholders invest in building the practices, uh, in building capacities of institutions to achieve sustainable rural economies. Third, 
mass education and awareness remain critical tool in tackling fragility and moving rural economies towards long-term resilience. While climate change might be a familiar concept in urban communities, not same can be said of rural communities. Rural dwellers must be made aware of the changes in their communities and how best to respond to such changes. They must know why they are having more or less rainfall than they uh, are familiar with and why rainy and dry seasons are changing. They must be made aware of some of the weather events happening around the world and what implication those events will have on their economic activities. In some communities, certain global phenomena are still attributed to witchcraft or juju, as they say in my part of the world. They must be made to know the facts and not superstition. Fourth, the youth must remain at the core of any development agenda. Opportunities are bound for them, but they are also faced with challenges. In Nigeria, over 65% of the population of about 190 million are youth, many of, them, uh, many of whom are in rural areas. The youth bulge is real and will constitute a problem if not addressed. Undoubtedly, as the number of youth increases, so do their unemployment rate. In terms of gender differentiation, available statistics indicate that a large proportion of the unemployed youth are female. The rising unemployment of youth is particularly pro problematic. Some of these unemployed youth are either uneducated or semi-educated. They are found mainly in the informal sector of the rural economies. It is characterized by low productivity as a result of lack of or poor education or poor on-the-job training. They are cheap recruits for organized crimes and terrorism. It is a well-known fact that the unemployment induces social and political pressure, resulting in short-term solutions that are usually not sustainable in the long run. This is because the processes are not strategically formulated and they are not systematically worked out. Without any doubt, education can improve the situation and girl-child education must be given greater attention. Other resources, land, capital, and services must be provided so that a trained youth will be self-employed and also be employer of labor, make profit, have a stable family life, in a healthy community, within a united, stable, secure, and happy environment and nation. Fifth, more than 80% of agricultural production comes from smallholders. Therefore, any workable food system must put smallholders first. They feed the world and can do more if empowered with the latest economic practices in combination with appropriate adapted inputs, improved seeds and fertilizer, with the use of ICT for information dissemination on extension, marketing, and so on. Keys to fixing this problem are supplying smallholders with appropriate seeds and fertilizer providing education and appropriate labor, uh, labor saving machines 
and training, ensuring easy access to markets with expanded economic space through value addition. Mobile phone has positively impacted on all of this in the last decade or so. Sixth, inclusive growth is one of the key challenges of the 21st century, particularly in the rural areas of Africa. Although poverty rates are falling, the number of people, or the number of poor people have increased based on the 2017 state of food security and nutrition in the world uh, report. Besides, inequality remains unacceptably high in several countries. There is urgent need to rectify this problem before it turns ugly. It is a fact that terrorist groups use food and money in recruitment drive to cause mayhem and destruction wherever they operate. A desperate, hungry person is a soft target that government and or WFP and IFAD, um, uh, uh, government and WFP uh, public IFAD social safety net can, on the other hand, be a weapon of winning hearts and minds and peace. Other example of alleviating poverty and hunger is the concept of food for work in the field. The UN Food Agency collaborate with IFAD, providing irrigation infrastructure, FAO providing the seeds, and WFP feeding the people. This commendable program should be scaled up and improved upon. Seventh, there is need to sustain the emphasis on fair trade. Developing countries should strengthen initiatives and efforts to ensure that rural economies are fairly considered and are given the opportunity to thrive in a global economy that is increasingly promoting inequality. In Africa, one way to achieve this is to improve intra-African trade. Intra-African trade accounts for a dismal 12% on the continent. Boosting intra-African trade should provide an excellent opportunity to protect farmers and other small businesses on a, a sub-regional level to create greater economies of scale and to increase competition in inefficient agricultural industries. These benefits will translate directly to healthier local economies and numerous jobs with the smallholder farmers at the heart of booming food economy and value addition in agriculture. Eight, the importance of leadership and strategic policy formulation and implementation cannot be overemphasized in the move to reduce African nations' agricultural import costs. When Nigeria embarked on strong leadership and skillful policy implementation of self-sufficiency in rice production, Nigeria experienced a significant rice production increase in a space of four years. That program still continues, and the Nigerian private sector responded accordingly and appropriately, creating jobs in allied industries while imports fell. Ladies and gentlemen, there's no doubt that there is a lot of work to be done. In transforming the rural economies of fragility, 
and fragile community and state to economy that are sustainable and resilient. Let me conclude by, uh, let me conclude my address by touching on a rather urgent matter of funding for those institutions that are at the forefront of getting the work done. We cannot be talking of moving from fragility to resilience if we have fragile institutions to do the work. If the job is to be done as it should be done, institutions like IFAD will require strong support. This is why it is critical that all members of organizations like IFAD fulfill their financial obligations to the organization and support it with the right policies and frameworks that are financially backed to achieve its mandate and agenda. In conclusion, to get adequate investment for sustainable rural economies so as to prevent fragility and enhance resilience, three factors must come together at the national level. And these are leadership, governance, and development. If these are well in place, international efforts will be only helpful additions, complements, and supplements. Thank you for listening. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Abbasano, for this uh, insightful speech. I think we will now open up the floor to questions. And um, I'm sure you're very happy to answer some of the questions from the audience. Uh, so you, you better say questions or comments or remarks, <laughs> because some people may want to add to what I have said. I think we we're opening the floor to, bo to, to all of those. Could you please put up your uh, country sign, and we will. Okay, marvelous. We have a question here. Okay. Is it too, okay. Thank you very much, uh, Baba, for this great uh, statement. I may recall always something that you said to us more than uh, 10 years ago. A hungry man is an angry man. End of quote. It was about, of course, the homegrown school feeding program that you are among the authors at the very beginning. Before some people were talking about zero hunger. Thank you. So this uh, warning is still digging in my mind. However, as you rightly mentioned, in Africa, the biggest investors in agriculture are the small-scale farmers. And unfortunately, you also mentioned the youth is leaving the rural area. Knowledge and experience also are escaping from this area. So in the very near future, when we checked, in Africa, we may have also a great policy framework and you are among those who have been developing it. I'm talking about NEPAD and the flagship program, which is CADAP. More than 42 countries in Africa have already developed their National Agriculture, Food Security, and Nutrition Investment Plan. However, if you look around in this conference room, when most of the head of delegations are talking, and it's the same thing at FAO and WFP, I'm still wondering why they are shy to talk about these achievements and what they are doing and what they are committed to do to help these small-scale farmers 
to transform the rural area and agriculture in Africa. So my question is about how really to have real champions in Africa from the ground to help, I'm talking about helping the political people to meet their, their commitments. So this is my question, thank you very much. So thank you, Zimbabwe. So the question, how can we have real well, that, champions? That, 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 that. Do we take another one? Well, well, maybe we should take another one so that, uh, because your, the prelude to your question is longer than your question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, I, I, I will deal with the question. <clears throat> Somebody there. So Benin. Thank you, Madam. Comme le représentant du NEPAD qui vient de nous précéder, le Bénin voudrait remercier le président Obasanjo pour son discours éloquent. Please, please wait for me. Go ahead. Donc, comme le représentant du NEPAD qui nous a précédé, le Bénin voudrait remercier le président Obasanjo pour son discours éloquent et également le président du FIDA qui nous donne l'opportunité de ce débat sur la fragilité. La fragilité qui en effet aujourd'hui est un défi majeur. Ok, ok. Can I go ahead? Go ahead. La, la fragilité qui est un défi majeur de développement sur notre continent africain. La forte croissance de la population sur le continent, l'urbanisation rapide, mais également, comme vous l'avez précisé, Monsieur le Président, les migrations, les déplacements de personnes, et également les changements climatiques sont les facteurs de fragilité sur notre continent. Comment passer de la fragilité à la situation de résilience Comment remédier à la fragilité Vous nous avez donné quelques idées. Il n'y a certes pas de mode d'emploi qu'on pourrait répliquer partout. Et en tant que communauté internationale, avec l'aide des institutions comme le FIDA, nous allons devoir réfléchir. Et vous nous avez dit, le temps n'est plus à la réflexion, le temps est à l'action. Vous nous avez dit exactement il y a quelques minutes, il faut agir. Alors, vous nous avez proposé des solutions et vous avez dit, entre autres, qu'il faudrait que la communauté internationale pense à développer des stratégies visant à améliorer les conditions de vie des populations rurales. Et vous avez également abordé la question de la jeunesse rurale et l'accès à l'emploi. Permettez, Monsieur le Président, parce que je suis une femme et parce que les femmes au Bénin dans, ont un rôle clé dans le secteur rural, que j'ajoute une petite dimension à la phrase que vous avez présentée il y a quelques minutes, c'est-à-dire que nous devrons tous ensemble, nous, communautés internationales, développer des stratégies visant à améliorer les conditions de vie des populations rurales de façon équitable sous la perspective du genre. Merci. Thank you. So maybe we ask I, I think I should, I should questions. come in. I should come in now. Give some time for some further <coughs> shorter questions from the audience. Thank you. Thank you very much. The, the, the first point and, and all the things you said that I have said in the past, you are right. The hungry man is an angry man. Um, and um, we, we can see that. In fact, that is why If you ask me what is my greatest fear for Africa, I will say is the youth. And if you ask me what is my greatest hope for Africa, I will again say is the youth. Now, because it depends on how we handle this issue of the youth, um, that we are, if we handle it well, yes, the population that we are worried about will become an asset. If we do not handle it well, we are all sitting on a keg of gunpowder. And when the youth are frustrated and are angry, now their anger will know no boundary. Now, if you are talking about anything which is either 
religiously motivated or regionally motivated, you can contain them. Take Boko Haram in Nigeria. It's partly religiously motivated and um, a little bit uh, regionally motivated. Now, but we can contain it and, and, and deal with it. But if it becomes something that all the youth in Nigeria become involved in, it will explode like an atomic bomb and there will be no way we can handle it. So you ask the question, uh, we talk of zero hunger, of course, yes. The, um, I, the uh, target number two, or object, uh, objective number two in the sustainable development goal uh, is zero hunger by 2030. And what Africa, in fact, Africa had, uh, AU had anticipated that. They have gone for zero hunger by 2025 before um, uh, the international community came up with 2030. And, um, and I believe this, could, this, this can be achieved. What we did in Nigeria is to take the zero hunger and see what should be the strategy that should be applied or employed. We are not trying to reinvent the world that should be applied or employed at the family level, at the community level, at the local government level, at the state government level, and at the national level to achieve uh, zero hunger by uh, 2025. And um, we, ha we have produced a report. And the usual thing is to write a report and put it in the shelf and it gathers uh, spider's web and dust. Now we say this report, we are going to see it through. So we form a zero hunger forum and we, were, we are going from state to state and seeing what the state is doing, how they are implementing their program, uh, what can we do to help them or who can we ginger? Is it the federal government? Is it the central bank? Is it the commercial bank? Is it the research? Um, is it the marketing or is it the processor? Uh, is it the exporter? Um, and you then ask, who is the real champion? I believe what we need to do is to ensure that we have, we bring ch uh, youth into agriculture. We have to glamorize agriculture to make it, um, uh, to, to make them feel co uh, involved. When I go around the world and they say, what is your profession? I say, I'm, an, I'm a farmer. And, um, and I proudly say that. Now we need to create model farmers that will make young people come in. Now, I, so that is the champion. We have to create champions. And we have got something now we call uh, uh, African um, um, food price. Again, we are, it's a way of creating champions in all areas of food. Now let me come to the uh, second question, rapid urbanization. Actually, I did not uh, stress that enough in my um, uh, presentation. But in, 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 in our book, um, Making Africa Work, that uh, Gilbert talked about, we, we stress that. Now, by the year 2050, the population of Africa will be over 2 billion. Now, Nigeria's population, which was 45 million at independence, is now about 190 million going to 200 million. By the year 2050, we will be over 450 million. Now, if we cannot deal adequately with the uh, 200 million that we have now, we cannot provide a, a, a food for them, we cannot educate them adequately, we cannot give them skill, we cannot empower them, we cannot uh, give them employment, I wonder what would be the solution 
when we had 450 million in uh, uh, less than, what, 35 years from now. Now, so what do we have to do? Uh, and mind you, 80% of that population will live in cities. Take a, 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 a city like Lagos, now 20 million. By that time, Lagos will be over 30 million. Think of the sanitation, think of transportation, think of employment, uh, think of housing. Um, it, it is mind boggling. So what do we have to do? We have to start now. So when I say now is the time, I, I, I think um, I'm saying what is obvious. But you talk about uh, in all these international community and gender. Yes, um, I concluded my presentation by saying three things are important. Leadership at the national level, leadership, governance, and development. It is when that is on the ground, in place, at the national level, that the international effort will have the desired effect. It will be addition. Mm -hmm. It will be complementary. It will be supplementary. We must not expect the international community to do for us what we have to do for ourselves. Uh, we have to. We have a, a, a practice in my own part of the world. When you have a load to carry, you put a pad on your head, you bend uh, by your load, and people coming around will know that, yes, you need a helping hand. They will join you and help you to carry the load on your head. But you don't stand by your load without a pad on the head and expect the passers-by to carry the load for you. Now Thank that, you. That's what we are doing. So we have a now, last question uh, from Zimbabwe here. Oh yeah, let me you. just do and that would be the final question. The, that question was yeah. uh, ended on the issue of gender. Now, women are major food producers in Africa particularly. And whatever handicap they have, access to land, access to credit, access to uh, um, market and all that has to be given to them. What is important now is that there are different organizations. One at the AU level is what we call EWA, Empowering Women in Agriculture. And I'm one of the um, uh, patrons of that. And the Africa Development Bank and other organizations are looking at how to help women in agriculture directly. So there is also gender issue, which is being paid attention. But what is important is that what we call uh, the declaration that gave, brought about Cardiff, where we say that all African government must spend 10% mm -hmm. of their um, of their uh, budget on agriculture, that we must insist is achieved. Thank you. So one more question. Thank you, Chair. I would want also to thank uh, His Excellency Obasanjo for this revealing uh, presentation. My question is to him is that uh, where we are trying to transform rural com economies, uh, is, what is this organization doing to mitigate climate change at that level? Because as we are all aware, climate change is a result of human activities like a bad agricultural practice, among others. I think it is also important to teach rural communities the importance of trees because the rate of deforestation in Africa is really uh, alarming. If you one follows the statistics from the WWF, the consequences are not only affecting us humans, but even the wildlife and other things. So I would want to urge uh, His Excellency and his organization to put up a very strong um, awareness campaign so that rural communities are able to 
uh, sustainably utilize forest resources, including trees. Without trees, there's no groundwater, there's no rainfall. So adaptation, where are we taking it from? I think mitigation is very, very important element that the communities need to be taught. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, you came back to what I said. Um, our national governments have to do what they have to do. And um, the awareness uh, that we talk about, and I talk about it in my presentation, um, we have seen things that are changing in our different um, ecological areas and different countries, and they are changing because of climate change. Now we have to let our people know that these changes will continue to take place and we should let them know through education and awareness that what they have to do, rainfall patterns are changing. Um, in, 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 in parts of Nigeria, we, we, we have, as you go in, you can plant maize by March. And now if you plant maize by, by March in any part of Nigeria, where there is no um, uh, some form of river for irrigation. Um, it, it will be a failure. But when I was growing up, people play, plant ma uh, uh, maize in March. So rain period has shifted uh, by almost a month. You can only plant maize now by uh, April and hope that you'll get something. Uh, Thank so you very that is much. The sort of yeah. thing we have to let people know that these things are happening, they are, and they will continue to happen, and it is a result of climate change. And I talk about Cape Town, uh, the water uh, problem there is partly a result of climate change. Yeah. The aquifer, from where you can get land, uh, water down to um, uh, underground water, is going down and down further and further. Now, these are the effects of climate change, and we should let our people know. And if they know, we should also let them know what they can do to counter it or to make them survive it. Thank you enormously, Dr. Abbasanjo.